some of you know, as we were just singing, and some some do not. Um, the Brady Bunch was a, a extraordinarily popular uh, family sitcom in the early '70s, and had this aesthetically notable intro of uh, the whole family appearing in these multiple headshots videos, all looking at each other during the song. It was impossible to get out of your brain. And you know, if you replace the title with a figure, that's what most of us have been experiencing for you know six to eight months now. Uh, and it certainly has its place, but there are also ways in which these kinds of meetings are very tiring for people and uh, don't always serve as the best communication. And in some discussions in the background with Carney folks, that's how we got to thinking about, well, let's try to connect on this meta method of how we interact with each other. Um, because I think there would be, there's a broad base of knowledge of different people trying different kinds of systems. And uh, also we could all benefit from just knowing what each other are doing. So some of the things we're gonna talk about today are kind of small technical details, some of them larger things. And I wanna start at that broadest context, which is why I'm saying, what is the purpose of meeting? And certainly in the corporate world, there's this kind of notion of, man, a lot of meetings could just be emails. Uh, and I think that can apply to academia as well. Not necessarily um, everything works that way because a lot of what we do is uh, comparing and contrasting ideas, but it's a, it's a thing we're thinking about. So while I don't plan to go into these things in detail, I thought I'd start really from the beginning of why are we communicating at all? And since these are things that I have seen in industrial sectors that aren't as popular in academia, just sort of put a bookmark there that there are many kinds of ways of keeping track of, say, what a lab does, if you're a PI, or even if you're a grad student, figuring out how do you know what to be doing with yourself. And so here I'm listing a bunch of project systems and platforms, and the distinctions is that the systems are ways of thinking about how you organize yourself. So GTD, the last one on this list, is an abbreviation for getting things done. And in the 80s, it was like the thing. And it's a way of capturing all the tasks you're supposed to do and then move them along uh, through certain kinds of weekly reviews and so on. And, and the main thing I'm bringing up here is that when uh, David Allen proposed it in the 80s, he described how to do it on index cards in little boxes and you would shuffle index cards around. There's nothing about his system that requires you to have a computer. But of course, nowadays you would use a computer and that's what the platforms are. Those are all different kinds of software applications that some are more general than just this particular thing, but there are ways of keeping track of information um, that may help teams progress in ways that don't require meetings. Everybody knows how to use a certain system. They may know what they need to be doing and you can save the meetings for the more interactive discussions of really deep details of the science. And some of the, did we order that box of electrodes last week can be handled through your system instead. So that's a general kind of comment. It takes work to set these things up, but I thought I would just put a, put a note out there that there are ideas about how to um, improve your own productivity and your team's productivity uh, that not everything is a conversation. And the other major piece I wanted to put out here, and it will come back to some of the software we'll talk about in a minute. Today, we're really gonna be focusing on meetings, I think, I expect. We'll see what the crowd wants to talk about. Um, but uh, meetings are a form of communication and there's a huge distinction between synchronous and asynchronous communication. So the most familiar examples are a phone call is synchronous communication. You and the other person, or however many people, have to be on the call at the same time. So you have to block time in your schedule for that. Text messaging is asynchronous. You send a text message and you might want them to get back to you soon, but they'll get to it when they have a moment. And then if you're busy, you'll get back to when you have a moment, Slack's the same way. And a lot of what we force into synchronous communication can be pushed into asynchronous communication. And that's another one of the great lessons from this vast literature of meetings and productivity and team management that um, it's not necessarily peer reviewed, but certainly there's a lot of information there that we could possibly benefit from. But with that in mind, okay, if we're gonna talk about meetings in particular, I, you know, I made this up. This is just my own sort of thinking about how meetings work. Meetings don't all fall into the same kind of category. So what are the sorts of things that we do? Well, you know, one thing is seminars. Right now, you're all sitting there listening to me. It doesn't require a huge design issue or a huge lot of bandwidth to have one person talking to a lot of people. So out here, we have a lot of people, however many people are sitting here or you know, hundreds of people for uh, seminar, departmental seminars and so on. But there's not much complexity of interaction. One person's talking, a bunch of people are listening. 
you can have a bit more interaction for something like a town hall or a question and answer session. Uh, so it kind of ups the game a little bit. You might still have a large number of people, uh, but now more than one person is going to take the mic at a time. And what we're doing today is sort of in that category. I'll pass the mic on at some point and, you know, people will want to talk. And as you've all experienced, especially for open discussions, Zoom becomes a little bit problematic when you're like, all right, raise your hand if you want to ask a question or cut it on the mic or wait a minute, was that you speaking? There's difficulties, but you can definitely make it work. But as you keep going up this complexity of interaction to say a poster session or even something like just an open social event, a coffee, coffee hour, you know, it's just not possible to, to run these kind of meetings effectively with Zoom that funnels everybody into a single audio and video stream. So those are some of the kind of things we want to demonstrate today is thinking about, well, how do we hit get up into this part of the graph? <clears throat> Excuse me. There's also other areas where maybe tools could help. Even when you don't have as many people, you know, with lab meetings, yeah, you can make them work, but it could be nice to have ways, for example, to have more than one person sharing data at a time. There could be some level of complexity that's more than just single speakers. Um, things like office hours, often in the real room, office hours will break up into groups of students or whoever talking to each other and you kind of move back and forth. It's a bit hard to do with Zoom unless you have like formal breakout rooms or something. And then, you know, at some sort of extreme complexity of interaction is you say, you know, okay, let's go to the whiteboard and really work this out. You want to be trading ideas back and forth. There is a whiteboard in Zoom. I'm sure many of you have used it. There are ways in which it could be improved. So there's a broad range of things, and it seemed to me helpful to think about, at least along one axis, this notion of how many people are involved, but also this notion of complexity of interaction. Those are both important, and I think they're, in my mind, orthogonal. And you know, obviously, Zoom covers a portion of this, but um, you know, th there's room for improvement. So then I did a kind of capture thing of just laying out lots of different software systems. Um, mm -hmm and thinking about ways they might get used. And some show up in multiple places because they don't fit in categories very well. And again, this is just sort of my thinking about where many of these tools go. Don't worry about um, uh, writing this whole screen down because this is being recorded. And also we'll put these things into the Google Doc. It's not there yet, but so we'll put these things out there. And you know, I want to be clear, we're not endorsing any particular tools. Some of them cost money. Some of them have security and privacy concerns that you may want to address yourself. Um, you know, who knows? Some of these are actively being used by people around. Some of them I've never used, but I know they exist and they might be worth checking out. And if some of you have experience with some of them and you say, oh yeah, that's a tool I really like, or that's one I hate, I hope, hope I, I'm hoping that comes up in a conversation, but just sort of lay out the general kind of thing, right? So everybody's familiar with Google Docs. Overleaf is a more useful tool if you work in LaTeX, more mathematical or um, symbol heavy kind of stuff. Um, Coda is a lesser known tool, but is sort of living in that space of document organization, but also team organization. Uh, many people are at least aware of code repositories and it's worth mentioning that GitHub and GitLab also have wikis and also have messaging systems. So they're really more than just a place to dump code. They really can help your team keep track of progress with code and, and analysis and what people are doing. There's a ton of management tools. Uh, I think I saw Justine on this call. So, um, so the uh, project manager for our Neuronex here at Brown, you know, she could probably tell you quite a lot about which things are effective or not. And for large enough teams, certainly um, these kinds of tools are extremely important. Uh, even for small teams, sometimes they're helpful capturing notes, capturing knowledge, the online meetings we have right now, and then you know these kinds of communication boards, which are a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. Um, these systems up here are not as familiar, I think, in academia, but they're sort of newer, but they're kind of nice in that they're sort of text messaging, but also you can do audio text messaging. So you actually just say whatever it is you need to say. You don't have to type it all out on the phone, and then people can trade back and forth these audio messages to keep track of things. There's a lot of potential tools here that people might be interested in at least exploring. And I think for the rest of this meeting, we're likely to focus on these last two categories here, sort of spatialized meetings, which get into the upper right of that diagram that I was just showing, where you have lots of people and lots of interaction complexity. And then maybe, I'm not sure how much we'll get into it, things that are about, well, how do we not just talk to each other, but include graphical information as we're trying to get back and forth. So that's my overall concept of what we might talk about today. Uh, we'll see how it goes, let it kind of go organically. Um, 
but mostly wanted to put markers out there for, hey, there's a lot of things people could do that maybe do get beyond the Zoom meeting or maybe complement the Zoom meeting. You have Zoom open in one window and something else open in a different window as ways to help people interact. And you know, now I think we're gonna do a little bit of demonstration. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what David and Andrew are gonna do, um, but we'll find out soon and I'm looking forward to learning about it. And then I know that there's some other people here who may also have some ideas about some of these tools. And so we'll, we'll open it up. And uh, Andrew, please take it away. Hi. So I am also the librarian for CLIPS and also for computer science. And so I'm kind of wearing a, a hat to try to talk about um, a spatial chat app called Gather that we've been piloting in computer science and some of the lessons learned that we hope um, as folks explore some of these tools that are discussed today that um, if you're willing to um, ex experiment and try to incorporate some of these into your course that ways that the library can help and, and work with uh, digital design and learning and our partners in CIS to um, get through some of the hurdles. Um, so I've learned a lot just about trying to, to integrate, um, you know, to get uh, access to this tool or just to even fund the, the pilot. Um, but I hope that this will be a a less of an opaque process um, as well. So um, I'm just gonna start with this um, quote that Professor Krishnamurti, when he first reached out about why, why leave the Brady Bunch behind. Um, I'm sorry, it's very text heavy, but it's very well written about why he felt Zoom would not meet the needs of the computer science department in particular. And one of the things that resonated with me was this idea of an instructor sort of coming into these Zoom rooms and sort of you, you lose that physical environment in which there's sort of a warning that, oh, there's someone coming and so we can shift our conversation away, um, which I thought was um, really sold the idea why the library should be interested in these, these spatial conversation apps. Um, so just to get a better idea of what a conversational app or a chat app, um, in terms of technology, I mean, they're 2D digital spaces with graphics that are similar to like a Game Boy, you know, or a, maybe even Atari age. So they're not necessarily um, this, you know, you're not gonna be blown away by the avatar that you have. Um, so you are placed into a space, either that you create and invite others to or are invited to um, some of those template spaces include things like, you know, boardrooms and classrooms and conference poster sessions, but then they also have things that are aimed at more socialized spaces, like a beer hall is one of them, for example, um, that you could find yourself in. Um, and then you navigate, you know, basically using your arrow keys um, through this 2D physical space and encounter other folks within that space. Um, and so one of the, the highlights is as you get nearer to other avatars within your physical space, um, in the same way as you would uh, approach people at a cocktail party, the closer you get to them, you'll be able to hear them um, and then see them. And so it kind of has a built-in Zoom feature in that you have the, the avatar and the board, um, you know, the space that you're looking at, and then also when you approach people and the, the creator of the space can actually set up how distance, like the, the distance can be changed when the hearing or you know, the audio and the, and the video comes on. So in some cases you, you might have to walk up directly to have contact with that group. And then all of a sudden everyone in that group, you know, they will appear in the same way that I can see everyone in the gallery view on Zoom. And I would be able to hear those noises of folks in the space. And if you're moving away from them, or you're moving between people, um, you're only going to hear or see people that your avatar is near at that time. So it kind of, um, at the very bottom, you see Professor Krishnamurti talked about this idea of um, being able to reproduce this 2D space is sort of this benefit of a physical environment um, that is kind of lost in the, in the Brady Bunch model um, that, um, that we saw earlier. So, um, I encourage everyone to visit gather.town so that you can actually, as, as Dr. mentioned, I can't necessarily do both at the same time, but um, you won't be blown away necessarily. <laughs> There's a, a, a demo, you know, where you can launch and you can sort of see how this works. But even within this demo page, you can see, you know, the, the, 
the person as avatar is down at the bottom right. Um, and then they've engaged these three other people and they can hear and see folks within that space. And um, so this is just me. You can see me, Andy, here within the space. And down at the bottom, you see my smiling face on the camera that pops up. And there are some embedded tools that I'll talk a little bit about. But for, for the computer science department, some of the needs that were identified, identified for seven courses were, you know, how do you have a think pair share based on proximity? You know, if you have, you know, I'm going to have these people pair up and report back. Um, and then also, if you have people meeting, if you have a 400 person course in some cases, how do you have these sort of study groups meet up um, outside of the classroom? And then also have um, labs or sections where not all 400 people are meeting at the same time. Um, conversations on office hours. So if you have a TA that needs to meet with folks, for example, and um, to get back to that original thing that resonated with me and Professor Krishnamurti's description of this idea of this invasiveness of like the professor going into the Zoom breakout room and sort of breaking that flow of conversation, there's a spotlight feature. So you can embed within your space a podium where whoever comes up to that podium broadcasts to everyone in the, in the space. So it has allowed him to sort of regain the ability to, to talk to folks within the course. Um, there is a whiteboarding tool similar to Zoom has a, a built in whiteboarding feature. Um, that's a, it's a separate software called co-create that's partnered with gather. Um, and then I, I talked about posters just because I, I get a lot of questions with my other hat in terms of data management where um, different symposia like the leadership alliance, the summer research symposium, the um, medical schools academic symposium that just happened, you know, they, they had to go from a physical environment to a, a you know, one where we put their posters in the Brown Digital Repository and we have videos of them giving their presentation. But this could be one that could be perfect for the kind of a, a spatial app. Um, so in terms of the, the legwork for the trial, um, so uh, it was mentioned about Overleaf. So we, we, we've done a couple experimental pilots with the library in the past. So our Overleaf account, the history of that was very similar where um, we're the chair of computer science had asked if we could um, spin up a trial of what then was called Write LaTeX and, and Share LaTeX. They were separate companies. And so we did sort of a comparison trial of both of those. And then um, they turned into Overleaf and merged. And eventually, the university licensed Overleaf for the entire um, campus. And so we've had sort of that history of, of, of doing those kind of trials with some other uh, products. And so that was sort of the same thing here, where um, I think when Uwer first reached out, it was this idea that we've done this with Overleaf. Can we do this with some of these other tools? And so they had looked at Gather, Spatial Chat, Sococo, which are other types of ones. And this was the one that met their sort of pricing and um, capabilities. And if you're interested in, in sort of doing one of the trials, you know, having the number of classes, enrollment, how many uh, simultaneous users you would need, um, how long you would need the trial for, and then, you know, if there are funds that we can use, you know, um, from, from the library or for CIS or, or departmental funds that we can try to track down to get folks to, to be able to support that. Um, and then we began the process, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about today. When, when I first um, was thinking about, I learned so much through this process. I hope other people can learn what has to happen on campus to go through this. And, so Catherine Zabriskie, who's the, the new senior director for digital learning and design, and who's been the director of, of DLD uh, and ITG previously, but now it's been moved under the Sheridan and, and the Prozos office. Um, this is her new title. Um, she was super helpful in holding our hands through this process. And so I, I definitely want to encourage anyone who's on that path to, to utilizing some of these new tools to, to reach out to Catherine because I was unprepared for the number of, of, of bureaucratic uh, encounters on that path. Um, and so she was very helpful in, in knowing that even a free trial, because we've had some trials in the past where we've been able to get you know, a no cost for a semester, um, that we still need to go through this new process. And the two process um, has to do with the contract review, and then there's a security review. And so the, the security review, I think, is, is one of the most interesting 
um, because the um, you know there's new terminology. So for example, um, the library just licensed a domain of one's own um, reclaim hosting. So if you ever wanted to spin up your own um, WordPress site separate from like Brown blogs um, or um, have a, uh, like an, a, a cure, some other sort of out of the box um, that you need a domain to host, you could, um, so that has a, that's a platform as a service and that was a 150 question questionnaire that Reclaim Hosting had to fill out to be able to get that. So that was super involved. Um, and I have some links and we can share the slide about the, the security review processes for those. But the, the generic review process is about 15, 12 to 15 questions that focus mostly on what data is being collected and where is it stored really. Um, and so a lot of the, the the risk classification that Brown has in terms of data that we collect from students or research, um, that they're sort of aligned with that level. So with directory level information in terms of um, the spatial chat apps, you know, it's it's not, it, in this case, it could be where students receive a link and then they, they just join and then they create their own um, username. And so it's really capturing nothing more than their IP address. Um, and then for things that are more um, enhanced like that, that domain of one's own, the reclaim hosting site, um, because it had, you know, class rosters, so it would keep track of what students are enrolled in which class um, that was more in that FERPA range where um, there, there's that 150 page and a much more involved review. And then I, I noticed that there were some um, that are already reviewed by the federal government that CIS can kind of green light. So for example, in that, that board that was showed earlier of different um, like Trello as a platform is already on there. Zoom is already on there. Um, some of the Google products like Jamboard for whiteboarding um, has already been through that process. So you could sort of check that to see. Um, in terms of access options, you know, the university was helpful um, to say like, you know, these were sort of the options of how students could get access. So are you providing them sort of a roster and then they're sort of on that green list? Um, or is it just invitation only? Or is it something that we can set up single sign-on for so that they can log on with their Brown user username and passwords? And then the, the contract part, of course, is, is just looking at, you know, what are the terms of the agreement? And if there are certain things um, that Brown, you know, there, one of the things I learned was that there are some sort of uh, new company startups where, you know, they want to advertise that certain universities are using their products. So you might log on to um, gather right now and at the bottom, you'll see like Stanford and, and some and their symbols and all that. And some universities don't like to have um, agreements that, you know, they don't want their sort of advertising or brands being um, as a part of that, that process. And um, they look for other things that are more related to finance. And then um, I think that, you know, was a really, once we went through that process, it ended up being smooth and again because DOD and CIS were such um, helpful partners throughout this and one of the things I learned from digital design and learning is that they have this catalog of things that have already been approved and things that are not recommended so that they've already gone through pilots on campus because I talked to a lot of people who have done pilots and then that is kind of siloed information and no one else knows that someone tried something and it didn't work um, and so here within DOD supported like I found like Top Hat was really helpful to me because in the library we were getting a lot of questions about um, whiteboarding tools and we found out that for canvas um, you know top hat has a license with the university that precluded us from using like mentimeter for example um, you know, like a non-compete clause within the license contract of this other thing so that was super helpful for us to know like what what were approved tools for whiteboarding and um, this is their um, they have uh, instructor guides. So for example, if you wanted to use Top Hat for like embedding a quiz or you know, replacing iClicker kind of interactivity. Um, but then they also have this, this contact email where you can just say like, oh, I'm doing a pilot on this and I'd like to share my experience. And even on their webpage, they kind of um, encourage folks to report back if they've done a pilot. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I hope that the experience was, um, you know, that we've learned something that other people can um, learn from as well. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, yeah, that was um, a lot of great information in there. And you also, uh, you, you 
reminded me there's an entire category of tools that I had left off of my list, which is uh, quiz, polling, um, forms, any of those kinds of things like Mentimeter you mentioned or Google Forms or uh, any of the Canvas top at classroom things. Uh, let me um, introduce David Scheinberg, professor of neuroscience, who has some stuff to demonstrate with OBS and uh, I'm not sure what else, but David, please take it away. All right, I will give you a brief um, uh, introduction to a couple of tools I was I have used, and um, they are useful in the context of today's conversation about things you might do in Zoom. It turns out that the tool I'm going to show you most of is is quite useful for uh, much more generally, uh, and uh, you'll see that in a moment. The reason this whole thing got started was because we had a meeting a few maybe a month or two ago where. We wanted to keep track of time. And uh, while you can always have someone be a timer, the idea was that maybe we could actually just have a timer show up on the, uh, as a, as a entry on the, you know, on the gallery. And that has an advantage, which is that everyone can see it. The person who's speaking can see it. You don't have to be, you know, you just have to watch it. So anyway, so that that was the that was the impetus for describing how I actually did that, and uh, and then as I'll enter, as I'll show you, the tool itself is is way more useful than just what you're seeing right here. But uh, in any case, it does work for this too. And so again, this was a uh, the the idea was to have some kind of ability to create a timer, maybe reset the timer, uh, turn off the timer, and uh, in keeping with the theme of TV from the 70s and now 80s, I named him Mr. T because he was a timer. So anyway, that was the timer. So the question is, is it a pain to actually do such a thing? And what do you get if you try that? So I will start by showing you that it's uh, all that what I have done is based on a tool called uh, OBS, which you can certainly, um, I'm going to share my screen now, which is free, which is great and uh, is quite mature at this point in terms of its development. So uh, the first thing I'll tell you is that there's plenty you can learn about this, uh, this process. Uh, just if you, if you Google Zoom OBS and uh, uh, YouTube OBS and Zoom, you'll find some combination thereof. I'll also tell you, and we'll have this link that my uh, sixth grader who was a bit of an inspiration for part of this actually put together a, uh, a YouTube that describes pretty much what I'm about to tell you. So you can watch that too. And he has the links on it too. So feel free to do that and look there, but I'll tell you what it is that we're actually, the tool we're actually using and how it works. First, a broad overview. I'm gonna show you a tool called OBS that generates essentially video streams. And those video streams can go anywhere. They can go nowhere and you can just watch them which is not that useful. They can go to disk, which I'll finish by showing you is actually quite useful and has an application that's totally separate from working inside of a meeting. If you're trying to create a fairly complicated video that you want to embed in a talk, and this is happening more and more after all, because we have, you know, right now people are laying out like keynote slides that have a video movie here and some text underneath here, but then something happening over there and coordinating all that can be a bit of a pain. So it sure is nice to have that happen ahead of time and maybe have that whole thing just be a video. It turns out this tool is very good for that. Um, but it's also possible to use this tool to connect as a camera into Zoom, which means that instead of being just me through the camera, it can actually act as your camera and substitute for you. And I'll show you how that works. All right, so let me show you first all you have to do to get this tool is to go to the Open Broadcaster software website and download the version for you. So Windows, Mac, uh, Linux. So that's easy enough. Uh, you can install it. It'll ask you some questions along the way, like, you know, allow me to, uh, to, to grab your desktop and things like that. And on Mac and on Windows, they'll ask these questions and, and I say yes. So, but, you know, take that as you will. Um, and that's, uh, that will then install a program called OBS. And it's just a little program that looks a little bit like a graphics program. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, now, just by way of what else you would need, the only other thing you need other than Zoom, which we all have, although I should point out that you might keep track of your version of Zoom. They, uh, you know, it keeps working, but 
there was a period of time when this idea of a virtual camera was not was a little bit frowned upon, I guess. So I don't know. They were taking it out. So there are some versions of Zoom that don't support it. But if you go to download the newest version of Zoom, just go to the download page. It'll just replace your existing one. And they seem to be working fine. I downloaded one just today. And that's what I'm using. So the current version works fine for this. So that's Zoom, but we have that. The only other piece for um, uh, to get this to work is a piece called this virtual camera. So what this says is the program OBS is going to generate some video and that can then act like a camera. And so practically what that means is you download uh, a little package and again, we'll give you the link and on the Mac, there's a, a Windows, there's a package here called Windows installer on the Mac, there's a package called uh, whatever it's a dot package file. And both of these are just small things. You double click them and they install a plugin into this OBS program. So let me go over to the OBS program and show you sort of what it is. All it is is a collection of scenes that can contain any one of a number of sources. So this is a blank scene that contains no sources and is therefore blank. Um, my countdown timer on the other hand or I'll show you, uh, yeah, here, the countdown timer is actually just a scene that contains a text object that I added. I'll delete and then add back and show you how this works. Uh, this is just like a, a board, like on a graphics, like a Adobe Illustrator or something. I'm just gonna add something to it like a text item. So I choose from a large variety. This is why it's actually quite, quite a bit more powerful than what we're talking about. I'm just gonna add text, which is not very exciting, but I can do it. I'm going to call it timer, it's just a name of this little text object, and I place it here, and it asks me to put, uh, it happens to already be connected, um, and I placed it down, and there is a text object called timer, but I'm going to delete it and put another one back because it's too smart for its own good. I'm going to put another text object down called um, countdown timer and I'll just put zero and put it here. So it's just like a little object again in a graphics program. So here's where the magic happens. The magic is that you can actually connect this. It's actually quite powerful, but you don't have to know too much about it. You can connect this to a, a little program that's running in the background. And those are available when you install um, OBS. And if you go to the menu for scripts, in the tools menu of OBS, it'll bring up a little box that says, oh, I wanna add a script to my, um, to my scene. And if you click the plus sign, it'll already have some that are already there, one of which is called Countdown, and it's in a scripting language called Lua. So it's called countdown.lua, and you can just select that. And if you select that, it'll add it to your loaded scripts. And there it is. And you, I just went to tools and scripts, added that, and then it wants to know Okay, here's a you can set the duration and you can also set the thing that you want this timer to connect to. So I'm going to connect it to the thing I just added called countdown timer. And if I do that, you'll notice that as soon as I did it, actually, the thing that I had added and put a zero to already got is now being activated and has changed. So it's actually a live piece of text. It's not, it's being updated by this program, which is pretty nice. And it's there. Its duration was set here. I could change it to five minutes or reset it here. Um, I will, in the interest of uh, time, tell you that it's actually quite easy to change the way this looks. One thing you can just grab it and change it. You can double click and change the font. No problem with that. That's all built sort of in and you can figure that out. You can also get rid of this, um, this front loaded thing. I, I, I wanted it not to show the hours because I didn't want my timer to be that long, which is a fairly trivial uh, thing to do. If you um, if you go to the script, you can actually edit these scripts. And I don't want to bog us down with the details of how you would edit them other than to say that if you click on it, it will let you um, open the script. You can open it and you can actually see it. It's a file. It's actually a text file. So for those of you who are inclined, you can actually open this text file with any editor. I'll open it with text edit on the Mac. And, and here's the script. No need to read the whole script, except for I didn't want it to show the uh, hours. So I just backed over the hours and got rid of it. So for those of you who have even the mildest scripting 
skills. If you do that, you'll see that it actually change it. And if you reload it, I've now gotten rid of the hours. So it's, it's quite trivial to make basic changes. Now that's part one. I have a timer now. Now, what about part two, connecting it to Zoom? That turns out not to be so hard because if you install that virtual camera, also right beneath the scripts menu on tools is to start and stop a virtual camera. So I currently had it started all, I mean, uh, yeah. So it says start now, so I'll start it. And what that means is, is that if I go to Zoom and uh, click on my settings, which are somewhere, settings here in the thing, and you go to your video, like you've I'm sure done before, because you want to change your background, uh, my, my basic camera, if you can see this is a Logitech, blah, blah, blah. But now there's a new camera here. It's called OBS virtual camera. And if I change to that, now my camera becomes exactly what we see over here. So this is the connection between this program and Zoom. And it's actually pretty straightforward. So that's great for, um, for a timer, but it, you, you don't have to be limited to that. If you were interested in, for example, I was at a meeting with Anne and I had to run uh, for a uh, pit stop. So I put a sign up that said, be right back. And with our little logo and that stood there the whole time, no problem. Um, furthermore, it it's again, way more powerful than I've shown you because people use this program OBS for their fancy, um, streams that they do like on YouTube or whatever, or Twitch or whatever it's called. And so for example, it's quite possible to go into OBS and to add things like a, your own video. I hope this is showing up somehow. And a, um, and for example, a window that's on my desktop. And I know it's gonna be there. It's this window that's right next to my um, OBS. And so now, if I were, instead of sharing screen, I could just have my screen be the full blown, uh, you know, thing showing up. So I don't need to share the screen at this point. It's just my video. Of course, if you're looking at me in the small gallery, you're not going to be able to read anything, but it may be backwards. I'm sorry if it is, you can easily mirror it. But uh, in any case, it's a live, you know, it's, it's, it's now essentially screen sharing with me, except for that I can move my background around or kill the background if I want or change its colors. I'll click background and delete it. So now there's no yellow orange background. And um, I'm just a scalable window here. So I can move that around. And that's, uh, and that's all a new scene. And I can move between the scenes very easily. So if I had um, the desire to sort of set up before I was going to maybe do something and switch between them, that would be um, a fairly easy way to do it. So the last thing I was going to show you is that for those of you who are um, creating videos of data that you might want to again embed in a, um, uh, in a, in a say a presentation, this is th that's totally built into this program because this is all about creating these dynamic scenes. So for example, I'll just do something, but there's a button over here that says start recording. And now I can uh, say start recording and I'll flip it to the timer. That's very exciting. And then I'll flip it over to my be right back. And then I'll flip it back to this live thing that has a note that I have a meeting in a minute. And then I will go back to blank and I'll stop the recording. And having done that, if I go and look at the uh, recordings, I just have a new file here, an MP4 file, which if I wanted to, I could open up Keynote or whatever you like and create a new slide and say, I think I'd like to drop that. I haven't seen this, of course, so they just made it. So I hope it looks OK. Uh, and this is my OBS demo. And if I go full screen, maybe, and say play, oh, it doesn't look too good. Oh, yeah, there it is. Five. Okay. So this is my video that is made. And it's, and so you could, you know, it says, uh, as creative as you want to be, it's pretty easy to create a, a, a pretty sophisticated video that can then just be embedded inside your talk. So it goes beyond just these online meetings. It's a way of communicating a pretty complicated set of stuff. So I will stop there and uh, happy to discuss whatever else I know about this thing.